Some little while ago, I was here in my house in Islington, London, England, when the telephone rang. I was going about my normal business, much of which, as you can see, is dripping from the walls. I picked up the telephone, 226-9013, and a voice from Thames Television asked me two astonishing questions. Bennett, you interested in the journey of the Magi? You know, the so-called three wise men to the infant Jesus Christ. And if you are, how would you make a film about them? I replied that only a fool would not be interested and added, but surely very little is known. Exactly, that's our problem. Having thanked my potential employer, whom I am very fond of, I opened this Bible and read the only account of the journey of the Magi, the wise men, to the child Jesus in this very long book. Only St. Matthew writes about it. The other writers, Mark, Luke and John, do not even mention the journey. And this is what St. Matthew inscribed. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, part of today's Israel, in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men, the Magi, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country, another way. That is the story, no more, no less. And that brief tale is getting on for being 2,000 years old. And there is no additional historical backup to St. Matthew's account whatsoever. Now usually, I spend my professional energies examining voluminously documented stories about this country's history, America's, Africa's, Ireland's. Though Britain does tend to prohibit my investigations of Ireland's history, and though these stories can be as near to us as just 60 years ago,
the resulting films of these relatively recent undisputed facts, facts, have led to public rows, fights, and even one uh, lawsuit. Therefore, it could be argued that I must be out of my mind to embark upon a film about a 2,000-year-old legend related to such an explosive issue as the birth of Jesus Christ. But, with some trepidation and perhaps even a flirtation with death, here we go. I had planned for you to see me board an aircraft bound for Iran because that is where the Magi came from. Indeed, I actually went to Iran alone uh, to look at the various locations for filming and to ask the revolutionary government of that country for permission to film there. But unfortunately, I got caught up in the Iranian Revolution. I became part of that revolution. Well, I certainly had large automatic high-velocity rifles, and for what it is worth, I believe they were M16s held close to my head. More than once. Oh, Mick, uh, shove the luggage in the cab, will you please, and be particularly careful with the Persian carpet. And down in the south of Iran, in the province of Fars, in the city of Shiraz, I found myself standing before the entire Revolutionary Committee. And to cut a long tribulation short, I was ordered by the Foreign Minister himself, Dr. Ibrahim Yazdi, to go back to Britain and not return for a long time. Thank you, Mick. And believe me, when Dr. Ibrahim Yazdi orders you to retreat, surrounded as he is with multiple guns while you retreat. Not even the Ayatollah Khomeini himself could have restrained me from headlong withdrawal. But I am seriously digressing from the wise men of Persia, the Magi. But I thought that you would like to know why you are not going to see me dodging around the relevant antiquities of Iran. But, despair not, nothing daunted, you will now see me dodging around the Iranian, Assyrian, Babylonian and Egyptian rooms of the British Museum. Some 3,000 odd years ago, some 900 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, a nomadic tribe called the Medes moved southward from the steppes of Asia and settled on the great central plateau of Iran and bestirred humankind towards a sophisticated civilization. With such movements barely discernible amongst prehistoric shadows, were being born the societies of much of our world today. India, Palestine, Egypt, Greece, Rome, the Teutons, and we Celts, amongst others, would be affected. That part of our world towards which I had hoped to be now traveling was a place of enormous significance for the total world. 
the Medes, relative latecomers from the steppes of Central Asia, were made up of six pulsating tribes. And one of those tribes specialized in matters of the spirit and of the potential of God Almighty. This tribe was called the Magi. Over 2,500 years ago, the Medes began to consolidate their ascendancy and conquered the paramount influence in that part of the world, Assyria. And thereby, under Cyrus the Great, that country which we now call Iran became the center of a mighty empire. Indeed, the greatest empire that this world had witnessed. Cyrus built his royal city here at Pasagard, on the plain of the Waterbird. Around this palace, Cyrus developed a vast, far-reaching garden, which some believe was the inspiration for the concept of the Garden of Eden. And then this King Cyrus, the Great, conquered tyrannical Babylon. It could be said that Cyrus was the instrument that the Almighty used to inscribe on the wall at Belshazzar's feast, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Cyrus stated with some truth, I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king, legitimate king, king of the four rims of the earth. And by his imperial side were the magi, the wise men. They were the spiritual, philosophic, mystical side of King Cyrus and his thundering power. The magi were the bearers of monotheism. The concept of one God, so it is believed by some, was born on that great central plateau of Iran. And the religion that they preached was Zoroastrianism, inherited by the Magi from an antiquity as deep as 1,700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And they saw God as the Father of Truth. And they predicted that a Redeemer would come and do away with death and to raise the dead. Only a fraction of their written faith has survived, but amongst that fragment there is a hero will arise out of the number of the prophets, a mighty brightness will shine around him. Now when King Cyrus conquered Babylon on the far edge of the fertile crescent between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, he found some 40,000 Jews who were held prisoner there. And these Jewish exiles had said, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. 
how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. And Cyrus the Great released those Jewish prisoners and allowed them to return to their home in Palestine and above all to Jerusalem. And Cyrus the truly great consummated his wisdom and liberality by ordering in detail the rebuilding of the desecrated temple in Jerusalem, the visible nucleus of Jewish spirituality. Cyrus had created a significant bond between the Iranian people and the Jewish people. And that holy tribe, the Magi, must have been close to that decision. This is the tomb of Cyrus the Great. The power and influence of the Magi grew and was consolidated under another great king of Iran, Darius. The vast ruin of his magnificence, Persepolis, communicates to us today Darius's staggering power in the known world. And no less than Darius and his vast empire was the vision and power of the Magi on the spiritual front. They were the masters of philosophy. They had their eyes firmly fixed on the heavens, on astrology, on science, on astronomy, on the stars. And the ancient Greeks watched the Magi closely in some awe and the Roman Empire would consider them to be the makers of great magic. The Magi? The Magi? But, is there any true, proper comparison to be made between the spiritual contribution and the material, as I have attempted to do? no matter how vast and impressive an empire might be. Though the poet Shelley was thinking about another neck of this world, I could not get out of my head as I wandered through the magnificent ruins of Persepolis. Such a pity about Dr. Ibrahim Yazdi and his unhappy gun-toting attitude. I could not help remembering I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions red which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. But on the other hand, the spiritual contribution survives pure in spite of assault after assault, often by the established churches. However, onward Christian soldiers, behold their 
came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We have seen his star in the east. We have seen his star, his star. Now, if the Magi made their famous journey, they could not travel due west, the shortest route, because of that awful Syrian desert. They had to move northwestward, and then, like all who enter the Holy Land, whether friend or foe, they would have turned southward and passing through the hard fought for Golan Heights, they would have entered what is now free Israel. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. So, if the Magi, the wise men, traveled to Bethlehem to the infancy of Jesus, they would have passed through the land of his plea to humankind. Which plea would truly begin 30 years later? The Magi would have passed through, or close to, the very places where Jesus would preach during the last famous three years of his life they would have traveled close to the River Jordan, which today is a military front line. In those days came John the Baptist preaching. And John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. For military reasons, we cannot get closer to the River Jordan than this point. The Magi, the wise men, would have journeyed close to Chorazim, high above Galilee. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus was a Jew. He did not wish to be in conflict with his Jewish faith. Indeed, here in this ancient synagogue at Chorazim in Israel, he believed that he was a culmination of that faith. As I, who began this film an agnostic, Bend close to the words in St. Matthew, 
I find myself in the disconcerting company of a devastating personality. Jesus has, as reported by St. Matthew, an unrelenting unity, the totally integrated man. He has something vital, essential to say and he hasn't much time left to say it. Barely three years, as a matter of fact. There is no sentiment, only a dangerous truth. Of course, all truth is dangerous to all establishments, but Jesus was carrying the most lethal truth that love, love is not divisible. And according to St. Matthew, he was very human. He was not without human fear. But there was no turning back. He would parry a cunning trap. But he was committed to the loneliest journey. And there has been no human, as far as I know, more courageous. If there are people who doubt a historical Jesus, they must then consider that he is the most disturbing character ever invented by an author. Shakespeare himself never presented such a disturbing human revelation as Jesus. The Magi would have passed close under the Mount of the Beatitudes where Jesus spoke and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and his disciples came on to him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, Magi would have journeyed through the fields around Galilee where Jesus walked and talked with his friends. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns and pigs of thistles, and every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And the Magi would have passed Capernaum, where Jesus spent much of his time while telling his truth in Galilee. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a Roman centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And in saying this, Jesus was prophesying that other Gentiles, like the Roman centurion, would move into his Jewish world and would there follow his teachings, which came from his Father who was in heaven. No one, not even a teetering agnostic like myself, can question the strength of that astounding prophecy. But, of course, uh, that Roman centurion was not the first Gentile to recognize the significance of Jesus. The Magi, the wise men from the East, following their holy star, were Gentiles. The idea is that they, the Magi, were the first of us who are not Jewish, to know that a staggering revolution was born. But that centurion here in Capernaum was an early ripple from a devastating tidal wave. The convictions of Jesus were in due course to become the official religion of the entire Roman Empire. Magi, the wise men, traveling southward, would have passed through the towns where Jesus was to face his critics. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, members of the Jewish establishment, saw it, they said unto his disciples, 
Why eateth your master with publicans, tax collectors for the Romans, and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Then one said unto him, Behold, uh, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, wishing to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother, and my sister, and my mother. And the Magi, traveling due south, might have passed Caesarea Philippi. When Jesus came into Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am. Some say that thou art one of the prophets, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the Magi, the wise men, would have arrived at Jerusalem, where Jesus was to meet his nemesis. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, What thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? Caesar's. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went into the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, 
sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will, thy will be done. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they crucified him and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So the Magi, on their journey to the birth of Jesus, would have passed close to the destined place of his death, for Golgotha, or Calvary. And six miles southward, they would have arrived at Bethlehem. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. There are many legends weaving around the departed Magi. 
The most persistent and my favorite is that they fled from King Herod's wrath as far as India, where they met St. Thomas, who made the Magi bishops. Now, when I was a child, I remember feeling uneasy that they, the wise and influential men, had deserted little Jesus and his mum and dad during a time of trouble. Well, you see, I was being brought up on the inspiring Hollywood ethics of Tom Mix and uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., neither of whom would have dreamt of leaving any innocence to the instincts of a villain. Well, no one has ever denied that the Magi, the wise men, fled. Anyway, when the Magi eventually died, uh, of old age, so the legend goes, their now Christian followers transported the corpses back to Iran, where, uh, three centuries later, the Empress Helena, a mother of Constantine, dug them up and reburied them in Constantinople. It is a well-known fact that Helena collected Christian relics as keenly as some of us collect foreign stamps. The remains of the Magi survived in the Byzantine capital for over another 300 years till Constantine Palaeologes, Emperor of the East, gave them to the Archbishop of Milan. However, just 12 years later, the heavyweight Barbarossa captured Milan and shipped the Magi to his own capital of Cologne in Germany, where their bones lie to this very day. It is said that contributions made by pilgrims while visiting these astounding relics have largely paid for Cologne's mighty cathedral. During the war, the United States Air Force by day and the Royal Air Force by night lambasted this German city of Cologne. And I can still remember members of air crews who participated in that terrible retribution, expressing astonishment that somehow, amid the devastation, this ancient Gothic shrine remained towering and impervious to the myriad bombs and missiles which showered around it. Divine intervention. Divine intervention. Well, a little while ago, I was privileged to have a Chinese meal with one of my living heroes. Who today is an Air Marshal of the Royal Air Force. And I asked the Air Marshal over that uh, Chinese meal about the survival of this Cologne Cathedral, in which the reputed Magi, the wise men who visited the child Jesus, now rest. And the Air Marshal said to me, well, speaking for myself, when I made a bombing run at the city of Cologne, I actually saw the cathedral. And I distinctly remember saying, Boys, we'll keep to the left of the cathedral. We'll keep to the left of it, boys. We are not going to hit the cathedral, boys. And of course, who can state that that young pilot of the Royal Air Force was not the instrument of divine intervention? an intervention which preserved this last resting place of the reputed remains of the Magi, popularly known as the Wise Men. <laughs>